Okay, in this first session we're going to focus on attention and the now. I think the most important building blocks of mindfulness. So what are we going to discuss here? Well, the first question of course that we need to address is what is mindfulness? How do we define mindfulness? And what are the essential ingredients of mindfulness? Then we move on to the now, the present moment, because it plays a central role in mindfulness. Then we move on to another component that I think is at the heart of mindfulness, which is attention. Mindfulness is all about cultivating attention for the present moment. So we're also going to focus on the role of attention within the concept of mindfulness. And finally, we're going to focus on this training program. So what does this training entail? What are the elements of this training and what is about to come in the upcoming sessions? So let's start with the first chapter. So what is mindfulness? This is what we're going to discuss here. Well, first let me start by saying what mindfulness is not. Mindfulness is something that many people have ideas about and there are a lot of misconceptions about mindfulness. Well, first of all, mindfulness is not to relax. And this may sound strange because many people associate meditation and mindfulness with relaxation. And although people can feel relaxed and may uh, experience some kind of relief uh, and and, and tangentless um, states, it's not about in the first case, to, to become relaxed. Mindfulness is, uh, to, to become relaxed is more like a byproduct. It's also not a religious thing. Although it has its roots in Buddhism, mindfulness is not a religion. Um, uh, some people believe that meditation or mindfulness is a way to change thoughts or to not think anymore. Again, mindfulness has nothing to do with not thinking anymore or with changing thoughts. This is something we will discuss later. Uh, some people believe mindfulness is difficult. They know about all these stories about people with 10,000 hours of meditation experience or have read about the, uh, you know, the skills that are essential for mindfulness and they believe it's difficult, but actually it's not. Uh, there are studies that have shown that mindfulness can be uh, applied to youngsters, for instance, with intellectual disabilities. And many kids, they have a very high level of mindfulness. So it's not something that is, per definition, difficult. However, it's also not something that is easy. And this is something that has to do with the fact that most of us are very busy and are preoccupied with the past or the future and have a very uh, hard time focusing on this moment and, and, and getting in contact with this moment. So again, it's not something that is also easy. So it's not easy and it's not difficult. Um, and sometimes when people have heard about the connection with mindfulness in the present moment, they believe that mindfulness is all about uh, being here, uh, right here, right now only. And when you consider mindfulness to be something like this, it easily becomes something that is, you know, undoable because it's simply in our, at least in our Western society, it's impossible to um, become only focus on this moment. We have to make plans, we have to um, you know, use our agenda. So it's not uh, a way to not be concerned with the future anymore, but it's rather uh, a way, I would say, to create a balance between the present moment, the past and the future. Because what we see often today is that we're so much focused on the future, or so much focused on the past. And last but not least, some people believe that ha because it has its roots in Buddhism and it's all about those <laughs> things like meditation and 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 you know cultivating awareness for something like the present moment and it's it sounds a bit wishy-washy to some people and they believe for this reason that it's impossible to investigate scientifically but a lot of studies that have been conducted in the field of psychological science have proven that this is simply untrue so what is mindfulness well mindfulness is popular and i think for most people that you know, visit bookstores or just, you know, uh, read now and then, they will find topics related to mindfulness in most of the popular magazines, you know, about meditation, relaxation, yoga, uh, being in the present moment, stress relief, and all those kinds of topics. They have been around for quite some time now, and they have still been very popular in the popular media. Um, but mindfulness is also very popular in science. This graph shows the number of public publications um, from 1980 onwards to now. And what it shows us is that since 2000, 
you could say since the introduction of positive psychology, there has been a significant growth in the number of publications. And I believe the number of publications nowadays is about 30 to 40 publications a month on mindfulness. And this shows that, you know, there is something going on here. And mindfulness is not only popular outside the context of science, but especially last years within the context of science. And um, we also see an increased popularity of mindfulness in the context of clinical practice. So for instance, there is mindfulness-based stress reduction. You know, this is the first uh, training program that was developed by John Kabat-Zinn to um, cultivate and train mindfulness over a period of eight weeks. But mindfulness has also been uh, approached by different scholars and people working in the field. Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is another example. And Later on, uh, Stephen Hayes also developed acceptance and commitment therapy. And this therapy is also using a lot of mindfulness principles to cultivate an accepting stance towards uh, uncontrollable circumstances and at the same time develop commitment to valued goals and actions. Um, there's dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness-based eating awareness training. Um, the goal is for me is not to show you and that you have to re remember all this stuff, you know, but it's to show you that Nowadays, a lot of um, clinical practices integrate mindfulness. Either they're completely focused on mindfulness or they, you know, they use elements of mindfulness. Uh, and again, this shows that mindfulness has become increasingly popular. In fact, um, therapies that use mindfulness and acceptance, um, they have been referred to as third wave therapies as opposed to second wave therapies. So second wave therapies are cognitive behavioral therapies and the mindfulness based therapies are referred to as third wave. So it, it also implies the word that there is something new here. So what are the roots of mindfulness? Well, uh, as I said before, mindfulness has its, through, has its roots in Buddhism. And it was actually well, it has been around for quite some time. Two thousand and a half years ago, uh, mindfulness um, was part of the Buddhistic psychology. And you could say it's an English translation of the Pali word sati. And Pali was the language of the Buddhist psychology back then. And sati, actually, if you translate it, then we come to the definition of mindfulness. And um, you could say mindfulness is keeping one's complete attention to the experience on a moment-to-moment -moment basis in an open and non-judgmental way. So let's have a look at this definition because there, there's quite some, some, um, some elements in there. First of all, what you see, and I think when you explain mindfulness to people, it's really crucial to mention the attention component. Mindfulness is all about cultivating attention, being able to direct attention to, as it's stated here, the experience on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So in mindfulness, the present moment plays a huge role because mindfulness is all about helping people to get in contact again with this present moment. And it also shows us the way it is done because if we would say, well, mindfulness is about focusing on the present moment, we could simply say, what's the difference with, with concentration, for instance? Because when we concentrate on something, we're doing basically the same thing. So personally, I think uh, it is really important to stress when, when, when we explain mindfulness to other people that it is about the way we attend, the way we pay attention. And the way we pay attention is in an open and non-judgmental way. And in a few seconds we will address what this exactly means. But this is really important. It's a quality of attention and it's characterized by an open mindset and a non-judgmental view. Before we continue, I think this man deserves a lot of credit because this is John Kabat-Zinn and he was the one who brought mindfulness uh, to the West, Western society. He was a professor of medicine uh, or, um, or is a professor of medicine and he brought mindfulness into the mainstream of medicine and society in the 80s. And he was a clever guy because he knew that when he was, you know, when he was about to talk about stuff like meditation and, and, and yoga and, and, and this present moment awareness, you know, he would lose a lot of people that were skeptical. So what he did, he, um, he first of all, he got rid of all the religious aspects. And 
because of that, you know, the associations with Buddhism and all the rituals and all the stuff that people consider to be very wishy-washy, they were, uh, you could say, eliminated, which, um, which made it, in any case, easier for Western people to, you know, to get adopted to the idea of mindfulness. And he stressed the fact that mindfulness is about training attention. And because in the West we have concepts like attention, psychology deals with attention, it could be easily, or in fact more easily be integrated in the language um, and the terms that we have in, in our Western society. So he actually managed to bring mindfulness here. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for, uh, for John Kabat-Zinn because he worked with, with people with chronic pain, uh, people that could not be helped in any other way. And actually what he did was very paradoxical back then. He asked those people to, rather than avoid the pain, stay in contact with the pain and mindfully, mindfully be aware of what's happening. And so it was a very paradoxical approach and he was dealing with the people that could not be helped anymore uh, by regular doctors. So, um, well, again, he there's, there's a, deserves a lot of uh, credit. And what he did, he developed um, the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, an eight-week program that aims to cultivate mindfulness that has still been, that is still being used today uh, and has been the foundation for many, many uh, training programs. So let's focus on the core components of mindfulness. Well, as we said before, the first component is always attention because mindfulness is all about cultivating attention. The second one is open awareness and I will explain these concepts one by one in a few seconds in more detail, but just to give you an overview of what is to come. The third component, component is acceptance. So mindfulness is about allowing experiences to be present. The fourth component is about identification and the fifth one is about choice. So let's start with the first one attention. Well, in mindfulness, attention is paid to what occurs in this moment. And it doesn't matter what it is, is an internal feeling like an emotion, or you pay attention to a thought, or maybe your attention is directed to a conversation that you're having in this moment. But in any case, in mindfulness, you pay attention to what happens in this moment. So it's, it's about awareness of thoughts, physical sensations, emotions, feelings, whatever there is. But you're in contact with whatever is happening right here, right now. So the second component of mindfulness is what we call open awareness. And open awareness means that rather than judgmental, uh, uh, being judgmental and judging everything uh, within ourselves and outside ourselves, mindfulness aims to cultivate a mindset that aims to increase awareness of judgment and looking in a fresh and new way at things rather than in a, in a way that has been trained by all kinds of beliefs and viewpoints that we have about things. So for instance, um, what our mind does automatically often is judge everyone and everything around us. We don't like his shoes. We don't like the weather. Uh, this went wrong. This went good. I'm not good. This is good. So what we're doing is, is constantly, you know, looking at reality through a lens of judgment. And in this program, in this training program, in these sessions, mindfulness uh, and judgment will be a huge theme. In fact, there is a whole session dedicated to judgment because it is a very important ingredient of, of suffering. So in mindfulness, we become aware of our automatic tendency to judge things and ourselves. And in fact, judging can be seen as a way of labeling things. We put a label on something good or not good or ugly or beautiful. And um, in itself, there is nothing wrong with judgment. But when we become unaware of the fact that a judgment is per definition subjective, it becomes really uh, difficult because we confuse reality with the judgment that we have about reality. And mindfulness is pretty much becoming aware of this process. So mindfulness ultimately helps you to let go of labels and judgments and connect to reality in a more open and non-judgmental way. So let's move on now. Now it gets a bit more complicated because the third component of mindfulness is what we call acceptance. 
And acceptance has all everything uh, to do with accepting the current experience. So in mindfulness, rather than fighting experiences or trying to change them, one allows oneself to experience what is happening right here, right now. So if I feel sad or I feel angry, in mindfulness, one cultivates an accepting stance towards these emotions, which means that I allow myself to feel these emotions uh, rather than pushing them away or trying to manipulate them or change them or whatever. So you could say, well, changing emotions and not wanting them to experience and not wanting them to be to be present can be a form of conflict a struggle we don't want reality to be as it is mindfulness is about accepting reality accepting what is happening right here right now in terms of experiences um, it's important to know that acceptance has nothing to do with accepting uh, just everything that happens you know when somebody uh, wrongfully accuses you Mindfulness doesn't tell you to just accept this, this uh, accusation. But it's about accepting the fear or the, the anger that emerges as a result of this accusation. The fourth component is no identification. So, you know, when you listen, um, when we consider the idea of acceptance, you may say, well, if I accept my anger when somebody offends me, I probably will, you know, hit him or, or react upon my anger. But in mindfulness, um, it's all about becoming aware that there is a difference between what you're feeling and thinking and you, the one who observes the thought or this feeling. So you are not the emotion or the thought that emerges. And... I think this becomes clear in this example here. I, ex I experience sadness versus I am sad. When you state, I experience sadness, there is like an observer in there. I experience some kind of sadness. There is an observer, there is some kind of detachment. Versus I am sad means, you know, sadness, no, there is no difference between me and the sadness anymore. And I think we all know what happens when we get identified with emotions or thoughts. When we get identified with an emotion, it means that this emotion takes over our behavior. So if I get identified with my anger, I may hit somebody um, or I may start shouting. And, you know, afterwards we often say, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't mean what I said. I was angry. My, my anger took over. This is what we mean with identification. And the same applies to thoughts. When we identify with thoughts, it means that we take our thoughts very seriously. It means that we believe everything we think and that our thoughts become some kind of objective truth. So, in mindfulness, by practicing mindfulness, you, you learn that not everything is, thing is true. And personally, this was a very big revelation for me. You know, as silly as it may sound, but... Um, once we start to learn and observe thoughts, we start to see that, you know, thoughts are just thoughts. Clouds passing by, there's nothing you have to do about them. It's just a product of the mind, but there is no truth in them. So when we let go of identification with thoughts, their impact on behavior becomes significantly less. So mindfulness is about detachment or no identification, which gives more room um, for you to see that states like emotion thoughts come and go you will not feel sad forever you know you will feel sad but this fades away naturally and it may come back after a while but it will also fade away so you will not stay angry forever and the same applies to thoughts of course what is true in the evening of life or in the morning of life is not necessarily true in the evening of life we have so many thoughts and what seems so true sometimes it can be completely different the other day. So thoughts, they come and go, they change. There is no need to attach to them. So the last component could be referred to as choice. So, you know, when we focus on allowing ourselves to experience emotions, you know, accepting them, accepting them and, and uh, observing them, what is happening is that we actually allow ourselves to 
gain distance from them and not letting them take over. And this means that what happens is that very soon we experience a room between what we have always done, you know, our regular behavior, our, our automatic patterns, our impulses and our actions. So let's take the previous example again. So when I uh, experience an emotion and I get fully identified with this emotion, I may start shouting. When we take a step back through mindfulness and we start observing what's happening, so um, for instance, I start noticing, oh my God, you know, I, my, my body is getting really tense now. I feel pressure on my chest. I start having these very aggressive thoughts. This mindful awareness actually creates a pause between what is happening in this moment and my impulse to do something, you know, hit somebody because of the anger and what I'm actually doing, hitting somebody or not. And whatever happens, if you decide or not to decide to hit somebody, mindfulness creates room between what is experienced and the reaction that follows from this experience. So mindfulness, you could say, creates choice. And this choice is basically freedom. And this is the big difference between conscious and automatic behavior. So automatic behavior is guided by impulses and conscious behavior is mindful behavior guided by awareness. And this is something we will also devote a lot of attention to in in the next session. So these are the five key components of mindfulness. And maybe you, when you hear these, uh, this explanation, you, you feel that it, you know, it sounds pretty easy. Maybe you recognize yourself and you believe you're really mindful. And this is possible, of course, because people differ in the extent to which they're mindful. But let me give you some examples of mindlessness first. And sadly, many of them also apply to myself. But just to give you an idea of what mindlessness involves. So mindlessness, an example would be uh, rushing through activities without being attentive to them. You know, doing things quickly without really being in, in the present moment when you're doing them. Or breaking or spilling things because of carelessness or inattention or thinking of something else. Um, failing to notice subtle feelings of physical tension or discomfort. I think this is a big problem when it comes to burnout symptoms. Many people uh, notice that at a very early stage that the body um, you know, is giving some kind of signal. Maybe there is some pain or tension in the neck, but because of the mind that is all over the place and always is wanting to go further and do more, uh, actually the attention is drawn away from what we experience in the body and priority is given to what our mind is telling us to to, you know, to reach this deadline and to work harder and so on. And as a result of that, we start to fail to notice those feelings that are present in our body. And those feelings are really important markers of, of pain and, and, and tell us that something is needed. So mindlessness can also be not, be not actually paying attention to what our body is telling us in this present moment. Uh, I think this is a big problem for, for many people I've dealt with in the past years that... Um, we find ourselves being preoccupied with the future or the past. You know, when we wake up, and I'm not sure about you, but when, when I wake up you know, and I take a shower, when I'm taking a shower, my body is present, but my mind is all over the place. You know, it's in the future, it's, it's thinking of what is next, what I should do today, uh, what's happening in the future, what happened yesterday. So while my body is physically taking a shower, my mind is not present. So it's, it's in the future. And this is a very common uh, problem, I think, nowadays, that we spend not so much time actually in this present moment. Um, in the past, I've done research with, with uh, people with, with, with eating problems, and even for people without eating problems, we see that you know, we often eat without awareness. Uh, we take a bag of candy and we, you know, this bag is empty before we know it. And we were watching television and we didn't notice that this happened in the meantime. So we also see that um, mindlessness is in, in very small things, in habits and, and the things we do during daytime. And um, these are just a few examples of mindlessness. And what they do, they show us that in order to cultivate mindfulness um, and all the components, the five components that we discussed previously, we need 
to really carefully address them because they are prevented by automatic patterns that we have. You know, often we're not paying attention to this moment. Often we're not aware of our judgment. We're judging everyone and every everything. Um, often, automatically, we just fight negative experience. We don't want pain. We don't want negativity and so on. So many of the things that we discuss that make make up the concept of mindfulness are prevented by actually our automatic patterns that we learned over the years. And this is why um, extensive practice is needed. So this is why also in this training program, there will be a lot of focus on practicing mindfulness. Things like the body scan, breathing meditations, daily practices, applying knowledge, all these elements are, are necessary to integrate mindfulness because otherwise it's, it's, it's just a trick. And mindfulness is really a way of, of living. It's a way of, of changing one's rea- relationship with reality rather than just doing some tricks. And um, in order to break the automatic patterns that we have developed over the years, we need to uh, practice a lot. All right. So now let's focus on another key element of mindfulness because mindfulness as we said is all about the present moment the now so in the second chapter we're going to explore the role of the now uh, in mindfulness so before we do so i would like to do a brief exercise i want you to remember a beautiful moment from the past and try to think of what happened back then so think of what happened when you were experiencing this moment and this can be anything. Maybe you were, you know, you were holding a child or you were traveling or whatever it is. See if you can come up with some beautiful moment. And I want to ask you some questions here. Just consider the moment you just thought of. And my first question is, where was your attention? Back then, were you thinking a lot or, you know, was your attention right here, right now in the very moment? The second question, were you thinking a lot back then? Were there a lot of thoughts going on? My third question, were you living in the moment? Well, why am I asking these questions? I'm asking these questions because what we see here is as mindfulness is typically associated with, you know, stress relief and depression and all these things, but this shows that Probably if you're like most people, the answers to these questions are that in that moment, you were fully present. You were where you wanted to be. You know, there was no struggle, but you were present in that moment. And you were not thinking a lot, but you were actually what we call uh, mindfully, mindfully present. So what we find in research is that mindfulness is also highly correlated with subjective well-being. So people were more mindful are in general also more happy, we could say, in life. And this shows the bright side of mindfulness. It's not only there to, you know, deal with stressful thoughts and get away of negative negative emotions, but it's also there to fully enjoy life and to be present and enjoy life to the fullest as it emerges. Um, Another question that I would like to ask um, is think back of that moment and ask yourself, were no other problem, problems present in your life at that time? Now, was everything perfect back then? Was everything fine and nothing else, you know, uh, should have changed? Uh, you know, ask yourself this question. And some people say, yes, everything was perfect. But most people say, well, no, of course, like always, there are always things that could be better. There were always like smaller, bigger problems and so on. But I asked this question to let you experience that mindfulness and happiness, you know, it doesn't mean that you cannot be uh, some, no, well, let me, let, me, let me put it this way. Many people believe that we can only be happy when we uh, finally resolve all our problems. This is what the mind tells us. If only this happened, I could be free or I could be happy. But what we see or in this, uh, also in this example, that in order to be happy and to enjoy the present moment, you know, it doesn't mean that everything has to be perfect. You know, enjoying the present moment is, is something that is different from having a problem-free life, you know, those are two completely different dimensions. You can be, have a very beautiful moment and at the same time, you know, have other things that 
uh, bother you and so on. So this is also something to consider here. So the present moment. Well, what about the present moment? Well, as I said before, it's a fundamental aspect of mindfulness. And the thing is, we're not often in the present moment. So the question becomes then, where are we? Where are we when we're not in the present moment? And the answer is pretty simple, actually. <laughs> we're in our minds, in our head. You know, in the past, yesterday I did this, or last week I should have done this. Or we spend a lot of time in the future. I have to do this, what if this happens, um, and so on. So actually we can say that a lot of time we're not really present. Maybe physically present, but in our minds we are in the future, in the past. And you could say if we, for most people, if we uh, put this story in the, in the picture, you could say the past, attention for the past, and attention for the future um, is huge. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about them. And the present moment, as John Kabat-Zinn uh, says it beautifully in one video, he says, well, it's, it's like it's being squeezed, you know, it's, there is so little room for this moment, for this present moment. It has to compete with a huge amount of potential for the past and the future. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is creating a more balanced um, division of attention and expanding, you could say, the attention for the present moment and creating a more balanced uh, time perspective. So this is what mindfulness is about. And as you can see in this picture, it's not about eliminating thoughts about the future or the past, because simply you would miss beautiful memories and you miss the ability to set uh, energizing goals if you would eliminate thoughts about the future. So there is no need to do that. But it's very important to, for many people to broaden the space and the attention for the present moment. So we said that thoughts can be very problematic and that thoughts are often the reason why we're not in the present moment. And before we continue, we have to acknowledge, of course, that thoughts are a very pow powerful tool. You know, thoughts allow us to do great things, great inventions, they make plans, they you know, help us to solve problems. But the thing is, thoughts are oft often very difficult to turn off when they're not needed anymore. And this is problematic, of course, because once we find ourselves, you know, ourselves in bed at the end of a long day, we just can't stop thinking. You know, we want to sleep, but it's just like we're not using our thoughts, but our thoughts uh, are using us. And this is a problem uh, with thoughts that they actually take control over us. So, um, Thoughts take control over us and they, you know, they require a lot of attention often, specifically when they're negative and, 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 and appearing very dangerous. You know, they're, they're warning us for all kinds of problems that may emerge. What they do is they disconnect us from the present moment. Simply put, when you're thinking, you're not being present. <laughs> when you're being present in this moment, you're not thinking. It's, you cannot think about the present moment. You can experience the present moment, but thinking about the present moment is, is a form of disconnection. And thoughts can also be very problematic when, when they are believed to be true. And thoughts themselves, are, there is nothing wrong with them. You know, thoughts are, again, they're very helpful, but the problem is that we start when we start believing them to be true and when we start paying so much attention to them, they take over. And Mindfulness has a specific relationship with thoughts because mindfulness teaches us that thoughts are different from, fa from facts, you know. Um, I always demonstrate this uh, by, by, you know, by hitting something, you know, when I'm in a crowd of people, I hit a table and everybody is surprised. And then I wait for a few seconds and I tell people, okay, you know, what just happened, there are two things, you know, reality the fact is, I just hit a table or something. There was a sound. This is what reality is. What you guys did, you produced thoughts about that event. What is he doing? This is silly, a silly move. Well, why is he doing it? There's a lot of thoughts coming up as a result of reality. And I use this example to make clear that there is a distinction between what we think and what is really happening in this moment. And mindfulness helps us to observe our thoughts versus being completely caught in the train of thought. So it helps us to create some kind of distance. And interestingly, 
in this moment, there is seldom a problem. <laughs> you know, um, if you find yourself worrying and, 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 and you know, uh, having a lot of fear, simply ask yourself, what is the problem right now? Not m tomorrow, not next week, if I get fired or, is, or if this or that happens, but just now. Right now, what is the problem? And often, in most cases, there is no problem. Yeah, the mind tells you, but if this happens or that happens, no, but just get back. What is the problem now? So, mindfulness helps you to connect to the present moment and in that way, you know, reduce the impact of thoughts on well-being, we could say. Now, let's move on to the third chapter. And in this third chapter, we're going to explore um, the role of attention in mindfulness. As we saw in the definition of mindfulness, mindfulness is attending, is paying attention. So it, it, it is the central process of mindfulness. So what does attention do? Well, I always compare attention to a flashlight. And when we shine a flashlight you know, on, on something, we can compare this to directing attention to something. When we focus our attention on something, it's like shining a light on something. And what attention does is focuses our awareness on a specific experience. So we are, in fact, able to you know, become aware of something through attention. When we're reading a book, we become aware of the book, the letters, the story. When we're watching television, we focus on the television. We can focus attention on a conversation that we have, on physical pain, on thoughts, or many things that we can uh, focus our attention to. So attention helps us to focus our awareness on a specific experience, inside ourselves, feeling, uh, but also outside ourselves. And there are always two forces when it comes to attention. There is one force that demands attention. This can be something externally or internally. Uh, for instance, an internal, uh, something that uh, demands attention that comes from the inside could be like an emotion. So for instance, we could uh, notice that we get sad or that we experience some kind of, uh, of joy or any kind of emotion and you know this is attracting our attention it's, it's, it's requiring our attention but it can also be a thought maybe we notice that there is a very uh, beautiful thought or a negative stressful thought uh, and just we become aware of it because it you know it demands our attention you know, it's there telling us hey watch out you know I'm here but the same applies of course to external things like sounds we can you know when we're walking at the streets we can suddenly become you know we our attention is automatically drawn to a loud noise that we hear so a sound that, that we hear um, or we you know a tv commercial that that grabs our attention those are the forces that demand our attention that grab our attention but at the same time there is the one who regulates attention who is able to hold the flashlight and decide whether he is still shining on that thing or is directing attention to another point. And when we consider these two forces, so the one force that grabs attention and the one force that steers attention, mindfulness is about cultivating um, the second one. So mindfulness is all about, you can say, attentional control, attentional regulation, the ability to hold the flashlight and train the muscle of the arm that is holding the flashlight so that when, um, you know, when the flashlight is, is, should be pointed at something else, you are able to do so. And this is basically what mindfulness training is, helping you to uh, become a master again in, in, in terms of where you direct your attention to. Um, I would like to do another exercise with you. And in this exercise, I would like to ask you to try and stop your thoughts for two minutes. So whatever you do, try not to think of something. Try to you know, remove all thoughts and, and ban them. So, what did you experience? Probably you experienced that thoughts demand a lot of our attention. You know, thoughts are all over the place. <laughs> They um, tell us to do this or do that, and specifically when they're negative, they're like 
shouting and say, okay, you should really listen to this because else this is going to happen. Um, so thoughts demand a lot of our attention. And I think the most important lesson from this exercise is that it's really difficult, if not impossible, to stop thoughts by not trying to think of them. Now, paradoxically, what we do is when we say, I should not think of this, we create another thought uh, to banish, to, to ban thoughts. So we actually try to get rid of thoughts by, by creating more thoughts. And trying not to think of something is, is a very ineffective way of dealing with thoughts. But it's well, sadly a way that we often use to deal with thoughts. So not trying to think of thoughts, but stopping them is really difficult. And I'm using this exercise here because many people believe that mindfulness and meditation are ways to... Um, clear the mind, not think anymore, or, uh, you know, stop thoughts from happening. And this is, I think, a big misconception. So mindfulness uh, is about dealing with thoughts. And when we focus on thoughts, and we, when we consider thoughts, there are actually, um, you know, indications, people believing that we have over 50,000 thoughts per day, different thoughts per day. And of course, thoughts can be handy, you know, they can be creative. We can have all kinds of creative ideas, new ideas. We can make plans, uh, nice, beautiful plans for the future and so on. But of course, thoughts can be also be problematic. You know, we can worry, we can ruminate about the past. We can create negative stories about ourselves. Why did I do this? I'm not good. I'm a loser and so on. And Specifically, when, when thoughts are negative, we, you know, we use all kinds of strategies to deal with them. We want to get rid of them, obviously. And the most common way of dealing with negative or painful thoughts is by means of suppression, which means we actively push thoughts away just by not trying to think of them. Uh, often we also distract ourselves. We may watch television or grab a beer with friends or do something that is actually... Um, you know, taking our attention away from the negative thoughts. And sometimes we challenge thoughts. We say, well, is it really this bad? Or is it... Uh, so we actually end up in, in, in some kind of a um, yes or no game in our mind, you know, trying to challenge negative thoughts by finding counter arguments or, you know, comparing ourselves to people who are worse off than we are. You know, in Africa, so many people are dying and I'm complaining about my food here. So these are all kinds of ways that we often use to deal with problematic or unpleasant thoughts. Um, we know from a lot of research, and this is something we will also discuss later on in, in, in this training program, that suppression will inevitably lead to rebound. And rebound means that whatever you suppress, it will come back later. So yes, you can not think of a negative thoughts by pushing it away, but ultimately these thoughts will reappear at a later moment. And the same applies to distraction. We can distract ourselves for a brief period of time or for a longer period of time, but as soon as the distraction is over, the thought will reappear. So it, it only it's a temporary solution. And when we challenge, challenge thoughts, when we try to, you know, find counter arguments um, and so on, you know, it may help sometimes. But the problem is we're again spending a lot of attention in our head, you know, thinking, 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 uh, and creating more thoughts to counteract other thoughts and to find other arguments and so on and so on. So I think the biggest problem here is that when we consider these strategies, these often applied strategies, that the main word here is struggle. It's fighting something. It's not wanting to experience the thought and, and modifying or altering or getting rid of it in some way. So it's about struggle. So what is uh, mindfulness telling us to do? What is mindfulness helping us to do? Well, mindfulness means that we deal in a different way with thoughts. Rather than changing them, modifying them, suppressing them. Mindfulness is about observing thoughts, you know, creating distance. It's a bit like watching a movie from a distance, you know, just being aware that you're not watching reality, but you're watching, you know, a play with actors. And in the same way, you can, you know, observe your own thoughts, just like clouds passing by. Um, mindfully dealing with thoughts means that we take thoughts less serious. You know, we are aware of the fact that thoughts are not reality. You know, there is a lot of um, 
a lot of, you could say, bullshit, if I may use the word, in our minds. Uh, and we just take it less serious. And because we take it less serious, what happens is that we uh, also, you know, there is a decreased need to challenge thoughts. Because why would you, you know, if there is no, not necessarily truth inside thoughts, why should you take the effort to challenge them? And mindfulness helps you to let them pass because you're aware of the fact that thoughts just happen. And like clouds, they pass eventually. There is no need to modify them or challenge them. They will pass like everything passes. They're transient, transient beings. <laughs> um, so when we consider this method, the mindful method of dealing with thoughts, we can say it's, it's about letting go of struggle. It's not fighting anymore, but just allowing things to be present and observing them, just to take the, their natural course. It's not, you know, fighting them anymore. And when we focus on what's actually happening when we're thinking a lot, because we were talking about attention regulation and, and, and two forces, basically what we're doing when we're thinking a lot is that a lot of our attention is devoted to our head, you know, when we're thinking our attention is upward. And I think you all know this, when people are lost in thought, lost in thoughts, they, um, you can tell, you know, they're, they're, they're walking at the street, but they're not really present. They're like looking somewhere, but not here, you know, and this is typically uh, a thing that happens when we're lost in thoughts. We lose connection with the present moment. So all our attention is up in the head. So we could say very simply that thinking is attention for thoughts. That's what thinking is. Nothing more than that. You hold a flashlight and you point them towards your mind, your head, your brain, whatever it is. So what is the cool news about attention? We can focus attention to one point. And this point, whatever it is, it can be our breath, it can be a book, it can be a conversation with somebody, it doesn't matter what it is, but we can use this point of attention as an anchor. And we can always return our attention back to this anchor. So this is like a fixed point that we can use that connects us or reconnects us with the present moment. So what are examples of anchor? I just mentioned a few, our breath, our body, you know. Uh, an object, a physical object, a sound we can connect to the present moment by just observing sounds that are present right now. And these sounds, they function as an anchor because it helps to, you know, keep us focused on what is happening right here, right now. Uh, it can also be smell. Whatever there is happening in this moment that we can deliberately focus attention on can be used as an anchor. And what is mindfulness helping us to do? Well, mindfulness is using, specifically mindfulness meditation, is using, for instance, the breath as, a, as an anchor of attention. So mindfulness is actually attention for the present moment using an anchor. And mindfulness meditation is a, is a very a common way to do this. And what happens in mindful meditation is that we focus our attention on the breathing. And once we start doing this, we also notice when our attention is not focused on the breathing again. So there is only one way of, of noticing that you're thinking. And this is by, you know, being at a place that is not thinking. You know, when I'm thinking a lot, I'm spending a lot of time in my mind and trying to, you know, observe thinking by, 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 by thinking even more thoughts. It's, it's not very effective. So what mindfulness does, it, it pulls your attention away from the thoughts, connects you to an anchor that allows you to connect with the present moment. And as soon as you're noticing that you're not uh, focusing on, on this anchor, this present moment experience, you must be somewhere else. And you can observe your thoughts from this anchor, from this neutral place uh, in this present moment. And this is basically what we refer to as observing, the ability to notice thoughts, to notice when attention is drifting away or, or um, somewhere else. So this is also, 
I think, in a nutshell, what happens when we meditate. So meditation is not a way of, of reaching higher states or, or connecting to uh, another dimension uh, or whatever it is that, that people believe. But it's a way to reconnect with the full experience of this present moment and through this connection, observe when the mind is taking over or something else is taking, o- taking over attention and bring back attention to this anchor again. And this is what we call redirection of attention. So redirecting of attention means that we you know, strengthen our ability to hold the flashlight and pull it back and point it again towards something that we believe is worth uh, focusing on. Observing has many different uh, synonyms. You know, there are a lot of words that are actually meaning the same, like cognitive diffusion, uh, de-automization, um, just to name a few. Uh, it all comes down to the same principle. It all means going to a place that is different from thoughts. Basically, when you're thinking, you're not focusing on the breath anymore. When you're focusing on the breath, you're not uh, thinking. <laughs> And this is the good news about mindfulness. You can teach people in a very easy and effective way to connect again to um, this anchor and this present moment experience and gain more clarity and distance to thoughts and, and emotions or whatever is happening from this neutral point. All right. So finally, this training program. What is this training program about? Well, um... This training program consists of eight sessions, eight different sessions uh, covering the eight uh, most essential topics within the field of mindfulness. And the idea was to create a training program that uh, deals with all the fundamental elements of mindfulness in a very structural way. So one by one, we will devote attention to these elements, uh, both from a practical side to experience them, what they mean and, and, and in, in your personal life, but also in general, but also to apply them, you know, practically, how to deal with them and how to cultivate them. So in the first session, we focus on attention. This is this session we're talking about here, attention for the present moment. The next session, we will focus on automatic patterns and reactivity. The third uh, session is about judgment. We've, we've seen that judgment is, is something that often prevents us from, you know, connecting in an open way to reality. Uh, The fourth uh, session is about conflict or acceptance, you know, the ability to allow experiences to be present. The fifth session is about goals in the future. The sixth session is about compassion. The seventh session is about the self, the ego, or if you want, identity and the relationship of mindfulness with that. And all these um, seven topics will be integrated in the last session, which is about the integration of the previous topics and integration of mindfulness in daily life for the future. Because this sessions, these sessions are only a starting point, obviously. Um, and it's important to stay uh, aware of, mind, uh, of, of the principles of mindfulness and, and integrate them in, in, in daily life, uh, even after this training program is over. So this is just the basic start and then people move on. So the last session is about integrating those topics and integrating mindfulness uh, even further in daily life. What is in some way uh, unique about this training program is that it devotes a lot of attention to the scientific part behind mindfulness. And it tries to answer questions like, why does mindfulness work? You know, not only uh, giving people instructions, but also explaining the, the underlying motives and, and, and processes of mindfulness. So what happens when I meditate? You know, what happens, um, why does it, does it help to become aware of judgments? Why should I become aware of judgments? And what is the evidence for the effectiveness of mindfulness? Why should I apply mindfulness? Is there any reason, good reason for doing so? And so on. So it's not only paying attention to the evidence, but also the underlying mechanisms. Uh, and I think the balance between, on the one hand, science and um, practice is what can make this training a very effective package for people. Because it's, uh, well, it's creating a beautiful balance, I believe. So science is important, but obviously it's also important to not only know why mindfulness works, but also to apply it in daily life. It's a bit like 
playing a piano. You can read a lot of books of, uh, about pianos and so on and perfectly know how a piano operates. But if you haven't tried it yet, you do, just don't know what playing a piano means. And the same applies to mindfulness. You can l read a lot of books on mindfulness, but if you don't apply it and integrate it in your own daily life, it's, it's nothing more than a theory. So mindfulness uh, will be cultivated in many ways through formal practices like formal meditation, but also a lot of informal um, practices, for instance, like doing uh, daily routines with more awareness um, by uh, paying close attention to, to uh, the way we relate to ourselves, the compassionate voice in ourselves versus the inner critic and so on. So there are a lot of practices here that will help you to, um, to apply mindfulness. Uh, another example of practice is dealing with emotions. There is a complete session devoted to the acceptance of emotions. So how, why is acceptance important? This is something that is dealt with in the scientific part. But at the same time, how do we accept emotions? Now, how do we allow ourselves to experience emotions? Because it sounds beautiful, but how do we do it? So the practical side is also very much covered here. So this was the first session. I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks for your attention.